the people presenting in the other two sessions are going to find me afterwards. And <laughs> All right. So uh, my name is Tom Calloway. Everybody calls me Spot. So if you hear people randomly yelling Spot, they're not trying to be mean to me most of the time. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about improving the Fedora user experience with design-driven methodology. I promise. I know that sounds like a giant string of buzzwords. I'm going to try and do my best to explain what I actually mean by that. Uh, but there's a couple of key discussion points I'm going to try to go over. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the difference between a user, a participant, and a contributor uh, within the concept of Fedora, of course. Uh, and then talk about what is design-driven methodology, what is the user experience, and how can we improve the user experience in Fedora. And then I'm going to go through some example cases of uh, projects that are either uh, underway or projects that we would like to start working on. So. So uh, if you look at Fedora, historically it has been extremely contributor focused. We've put up a lot of uh, web applications, infrastructure, uh, a lot of how Fedora works, looks and feels has been directly the result of either attempting to attract contributors or the areas of interest of specific contributors. A uh, contributor has an itch, they want to scratch it, so they go and they scratch it in Fedora and Fedora gains a feature or uh, looks and feels a certain way. Now we define a contributor uh, as someone who contributes something tangible. That could be code, it could be art, it could be documentation, it could be wiki pages, packages, it could be beer, something tangible. And a participant is somebody who's participating in a project either as a contributor or someone who's active in the project, who's helping other users, testing releases. They're, they're not quite a contributor, and it, this, this line is blurry. People move back and forth between these and stages, but a user is basically defined as someone who consumes. So if you think of these uh, groupings as supersets of each other, so that uh, all contributors are users, all contributors are participants, and so on and so forth. Now, the best measure of health in any community, but especially in Fedora, is a healthy and growing user pool. Not necessarily a healthy and growing contributor pool, although you would hope that one leads to the other. The goal is to have as many users as possible become participants, and have as many participants as possible become contributors. Contributors and participants that are visible and positive influence future users. So it, it's kind of like a movie I saw once, but um, but more realistically, it looks a lot like this, which is something that we call uh, the community pyramid. And this is from uh, a piece, uh, a book that Red Hat actually put out called uh, The Open Source Way. And what it basically boils down to is the idea that in any user pool, uh, a healthy community has 80% of it being users or consumers. And then you have 15% participants, and then you have 5% contributors. But those people at the top, those uh, contributors and the participants, the things they do influence future user pools going forward. So you can see the future user pool is inverted. And so it directly causes people to come over and work with those contributors and those participants, which draws more users into the project, which circles and circles and circles. But that's w understanding this is why it is important uh, for some of the other things that we're going to talk about specifically around design-driven methodology. So when we say design-driven methodology, the idea here is that we are following a workflow, a model, that enables us to create beautiful, elegant, and innovative solutions that users love. Not just gets the job done, but users love. So this is basically the workflow that goes into design-driven methodology. Start with the problem. We've got plenty of them. <laughs> Identify a possible solution. Sit down and work with a user experience expert, I'm going to use the term UX from here on out, uh, to generate mockups for that solution that are designed to really make the user enjoy that solution. Now, if you can't explain the solution that you've come up with to this user experience person who probably has no idea how you're going to actually implement this solution, then the problem isn't really well defined enough or the solution is too complicated and it needs to be simplified. 
Uh, you don't really, in this process, want to be worrying about what is possible. You want to try to be extremely brave and assume that anything is possible. Now, certainly, I'm not going to come up with a solution that my laptop is going to spontaneously levitate as a result of solving my overheating problems. But short of that, I think that it's important to go into this process with an extremely open mind. Worry about how to make the user love the solution and not about how you're going to write the code at this point. And then code to the mock-up. More often than not, when we write code as software developers, we're doing sort of this backwards. We start writing code. We just open the editor, we just start writing code because we know what the solution needs to be. We don't care what it looks like. We'll figure that out later. We can always make it prettier. Uh, or we have this vision in our head that we can't illustrate to anyone else that it's in my brain and I know what it needs to look like and I'm just going to start banging that out and I'm going to make it happen. And the results are usually not, while they're functional in those cases, they're not pretty. And users don't usually love those things. Now, if you're one of those rare individuals that can just do it all, Many, many kudo points to you, but I'm not one of them, and, and I don't think that there's a lot of uh, people, even at Red Hat, that meet that criteria. So by coding to a mock-up, it doesn't mean that the mock-up says X, and it really is a bad decision. I can't make the code do X, that you can't go back and revise that mock-up with the UX expert and say, when I went to try to code to this, it just doesn't work. I can't get this to fit it's not a good way to, to make this application. It's not a good way to solve this problem. You can always go back and say, let's try something different. And the UX expert is going to be able to work with you and say, OK, let's make it look like this. Let's, let's uh, take a different approach to solve that problem. And then analyze the result that you generate at the end of this in the context of everything else in its ecosystem. because. We have all seen what it looks like when, and I'm just going to pull an example at random, when you load a KDE app in GNOME, how it stands out, that you can see it's not supposed to be there. It doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. And the users pick up on this, and they don't, they immediately are going to have a bias in one way or the other, depending on what their experiences are with that environment. And that's not to say that everything should be cookie cutter clones of itself, of everything else. but Everything in its own environment should look and feel like it belongs there, like it's well integrated, because that will improve the user's experience even if your code is terrible. <laughs> and so this process is not a new process. This, this line of thinking and the way that you work is something that Apple uses extremely successfully. Uh, Nintendo, Whole Foods, Ferrari, Herman Miller, there's a long list of companies that design and build solutions using this methodology. And I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room is, is probably looking at everything I said and it's like basically like, well, yeah, duh, that's really simple, you know. But more often than not, we don't, we don't do these things. We don't start with a vision of what does our solution look like before we start writing code. So what is the user experience? It does not matter how good your engineering team is if they are not given something worthwhile to build. And so we have an example of something that was certainly not worthwhile to build. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an iPad holder for your uh, bathroom that comes with a toilet paper roll. Uh, and we can sit here, I could have hours and hours of session on what the user experience means, because every time you ask a different expert, you're going to get a different answer on this. Um, there's an ISO standard that defined what the user experience is, and they defined it as a person's perceptions and responses that result from the use or anticipated use of a product, system, or service. And that sounds like I just read you a software license. It really doesn't make much sense. Wikipedia tries to simplify that by saying it involves a person's emotions about using something. But really the core point about what user experience is, is that you're establishing a process to ensure that what you generate from idea to solution to result is something that users want and love. And, and, and love is an important part of this because it, it sounds silly, but the emotional response that a user has when they're interacting with the software affects how they feel about 
whether it's good or not, whether it works well or not. Even if the code works badly, if the user likes it, they'll still come away and think that was a good solution to my problem. iTunes is a very great example of this. I don't think anybody thinks that iTunes is a well-coded, reliable piece of software, but the average user experience is net positive for that. So it has a strong effect on how they feel about it and whether they'll be willing to recommend it to their friends, whether they're willing to get more involved in the ecosystem that created it, and whether they're willing to participate in that community over time. So the Fedora user experience. So we asked this question, how does a user feel about Fedora? Now, if they like using Fedora, they're likely to keep using Fedora. Bugs be damned, they're still going to keep using it. And they're more likely to participate and contribute in areas that they enjoy. And this is really what we need to be successful as a community. We need to be bringing in these new users, having them enjoy the experience and want to do more with us and help us create more and better things. Now, within the OS, that covers the areas like core desktop usability. Now, when I talk about core desktop usability, I mean that there is a set of common tasks that 99% of users share on the desktop. And this task set aligns very closely to the default packages that we choose to install inside Fedora. We are, it's sort of a bit of uh, the snake biting its own tail on that one, where the default uh, common tasks that we assume users are doing are the ones that we're installing because the ones that we installed are the ones that users found and are using. So you don't want to get too caught up in that mindset, but for lack of a better set of definitions, that's what we're going with when we say core desktop usability and that set of packages. Now, one of the things that we would really like to be able to do in Fedora is have a much better idea of who's using what, not just who's installing what, and to better define what the users want, what the users are installing after the fact, after they do that base install. Are they all going and uninstalling Empathy at Evolution and reinstalling Thunderbird and Pigeon? Again, we don't know the answer to that question right now very well, and that's something that we're trying to work on improving. And I'll talk a little bit about an idea that we have on how to do that a little bit later. Um, but more specifically, I think that every graphical experience that the user has in Fedora is uh, part of the user experience. And you could probably make a reasonable argument that some of the text-based experiences count as user experience, but the mock-ups for those are really kind of boring. So uh, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm just going to set that aside and focus on the graphical aspect of things. But I want to make it clear, I'm not just saying that this is, is limited to the operating system. Um, we have to answer questions like, how does the community present itself to new users? How easy is it to communicate with others uh, within our community? Where can I get help for problems that I have? How timely is that help? Are we confusing? Are we frustrating? Are we intimidating? Are we unclear? Do people just not like hanging out with us? I mean, we need to know the answers to these questions because we want them to have a good user experience at all levels and not just limit ourselves to uh, applications within the desktop. So how do we improve the Fedora user experience? Well, we could do many, many things, but uh, the process that we think will lead to the most success uh, basically goes like this. Step one, measure the user experience. Uh, there is uh, a documented and standardized way of doing this. Basically, you record uh, users going through user experience testing. You put video cameras on the user, on the monitor, on the keyboard, you record audio of the user, and you give them specific tasks to do. You tell them, do this thing. And you don't tell them how to do it, you just say, do this thing. And it can be as simple as have an have a IRC chat, check an email, copy a file, open a document the sorts of things that you expect the users to be able to be doing in your default application set. Now, when you're working on a specific problem and a solution and you're testing that, you focus these tasks around that problem. You say, if the problem is users can't check their email and you've built a new email client for those users, then you define tasks that say, open the email client, send an email to your mother, and 
then you record them going through this process. Now, for the purposes of general improving the user experience, we wanted to focus on using core desktop functionality, which we loosely defined as email, web, chat, office, file content management. Uh, we also wanted to have them try to do tasks that happen commonly in the Fedora universe, specifically installing new software and updating the software they have, uh, getting help with an issue or filing a bug, and navigating and using the wider Fedora community ecosystem of web applications that we provide. And then once we've gathered that data, we wanted to analyze the results of that data. Uh, we, we, uh, we go through and we look at all the logs uh, for what the users did. We transcribe all the audio. We also look at uh, how quickly they were able to complete a task or whether they were able to complete a task at all. Uh, we look at any specific concerns or emotions we can detect from the user. If the user is constantly cursing, that's probably a good sign they're not enjoying that user experience. Uh, but you can also sense frustration when people uh, say things like, I don't understand how I'm supposed to do this. I don't know how I'm supposed to be completing these tasks. Or on the positive side, if people are like, wow, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, you can interpret a lot from what people are saying when they don't think about the fact that they're being recorded on camera. Um, this is not just to point out bugs. I mean, certainly you, you'll, you'll, you'll find bugs in, as a natural byproduct of this experience, but this really isn't intended to do that specifically, but rather to gauge how positive or negative the user experience is of the software they're being exposed to and the tasks they're trying to complete. Then the third thing we do is we propose potential solutions to improve the user experience uh, for the problems that are identified through this testing. And then we want to innovate those solutions in a design-driven way and basically repeat. So this is a process that if we're doing it correctly, we never stop doing it. We're constantly making new solutions, putting them in front of users, seeing if they make things better or worse, and then repeating that process. Now there's other things that we want to be doing to improve the Fedora user experience outside of just doing user experience testing. Uh, I think that Fedora has a lot of room for improving the way that it markets itself to everything and everyone. Uh, we don't tell a very good story about our strengths as an operating system, as a community, and as a project, and we need to work on improving that. We have a lot of very talented, very passionate, uh, very fantastic community members worldwide, and we do a very poor job of telling their story. Uh, and so we need to figure out how to be clever, we need to figure out how to be more visible, and at the same time be transparent about how we do things, but we also need to be brave and honest and, and proud about what we do. We need to be willing to say things can always be better and not just be saying, I don't understand why you think everything is not perfect because it just works. Because we're always going to have room for improvement. We will always have new ground, new problems to solve and we need to be more willing to point those out and say, this is really on fire right now and we need to spend some time putting that fire out. We also need to improve our communication. I think that we have the same problems that a lot of open source communities do where uh, our communication is intimidating to people who come across it or they can't figure out how to communicate with us properly at all. Uh, IRC should be a thing that users have a positive experience with where it's productive and friendly, not hostile and repetitive, which is what most users experience on IRC today. And things are getting better, but they can always get a lot better in that mechanism because a lot of users find that channel for communication and they're not getting the help they want and we need to work on that. But we also need to build bridges for users to find the existing participants and contributors that are out there. A lot of times our uh, contributors in the Fedora community are working in isolation um, only to emerge and say, look at this great thing I built for you all. And the users don't understand what's going on, so they assume that nothing's going on. Uh, or if they have problems or questions, they don't know how to uh, ask the participants and the contributors. Uh, and if you don't have that relationship, if you're not, users aren't talking to your participants and your contributors, then they will never become participants or contributors. So one of the things that we're working on now on my team is a project called HyperKitty, and I'll talk about that a little bit later and why we think that might be a good first step to trying to solve that problem. And that's a duplicated slide. 
Um, we also need to improve software installation and update experience. I think that in our testing, this was a very, very obvious thing. And uh, Anaconda rewriting itself from scratch using this model is just the beginning. I think that we need to take a very hard look at how we install and update inside Fedora and how the user feels about that experience. Uh, I imagine most users feel like they got kicked somewhere in that experience, and that's not what we really want them to think about Fedora or the, the software that's inside of it. We want to make it easier for people to get help. We want to make it easy for them to file bugs because most users take one look at Bugzilla and turn around and go running the other direction. Uh, we want to make it easier for them to work with each other to get help and to help each other. And so projects like ask.fedoraproject.org are a very good start at this, but it needs a lot of love too and needs a lot of improvements. And we want to show the user how they can participate and contribute so that it's obvious, it's clear, and we can kind of steer them in directions that we know we want the users to help us. Now, uh, there's one word that I haven't said at DevConf. Um, uh, so uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about developers. I don't think Zoidberg is going to be a good developer for us, but uh, developers are users too, and they want an awesome user experience just as much as everybody else does. And they especially want to be able to have something that is easy f to develop on. They want something where it's easy to find and install the tools and environments they prefer. And I would strongly encourage us all to think less about making new tools for developers and trying to convince developers to use those new tools and instead think about making developers love using their tools in our environment, in our community. That's not to say that if you have a great idea for a tool that would really improve over an existing one, you shouldn't do it. But let's make it so that they love using the Python, the Perl, the Ruby, maybe even the C Sharp stuff that they really enjoy using in Fedora in that space. Uh, and less about, let's invent a new language, let's invent a new editor, let's invent a new debugger. Uh, if you look at the average developer today, and I think this room is not as indicative as it would be if we were at uh, OSCON or FOSDEM or something like that, uh, the average developer develops uh, open source software on Mac OS X. And it's not because Mac OS X includes thousands of awesome developer tools. It's because the experience that the developers get when they develop on that platform is something they really generally love. And so we need to strive to try and do the same sort of thing for them so that it's easy for them to get what they want to get done, to get to the productive parts of their day, and still love the experience they have at the end of it. So let's talk about a problem that we have in Fedora. Basically, we have a general communication breakdown. The average user generally prefers to communicate via a web forum interface. Ubuntu has proved this pretty conclusively. There's a lot of, of uh, Linux-centered web forums that are very successful, that have a lot of thriving user community. For most users, they're more targeted, they're easier to search, they're thread-driven, they minimize noise on other topics, they can jump in and say, hey, I have this thing I'm trying to do, and have a high degree of confidence that they won't then get 14 other emails sent to them about system D. Most contributors, on the flip side, generally prefer to communicate via mailing lists. They're able to see what is happening across the board, jump in as needed, say, hey, that looks interesting to me, I want to help with that, hit a wide audience at once by saying, hey, I'm working on this thing, I would be interested in if a lot of people from a lot of broad groups could help me with it. So we have this inherent disconnect where the users are not talking to the contributors. The users are on the web forum, the contributors are on the mailing list. Now the current Fedora situation is even worse because the forums are on an independent website and uh, very few contributors are even active in that website, so they'd be lucky if they came across a contributor in that space. Now the proposed solution we're working on is something called HyperKitty. Now HyperKitty is a Mailman 3 archiver that looks like a web forum but is actually a view into Mailman. Basically, if you've ever seen the Mailman 2 archiver, it looks nothing at all like that. The idea is that we want a read-write interface to mailing lists so that users can authenticate through this portal and they get a web forum view of the threads and the mails that have come through Mailman. And then they can then click reply like it's a web forum and it will send a mail through Mailman out to the mailing list and show up in the forum view for the archiver. 
So if you like mailing lists, great, use them. Do you like forums? Great, use them. You're all talking to each other. So here's the mock-up that we uh, have. I know that probably doesn't look terribly good on the screen. I don't know. But the idea here is that we have an example of, uh, this is an actual post that was sent over to uh, Fedora Devel, and uh, it leverages all the nice things that you would expect from a web forum, a very clean view interface, uh, the ability to do searching, and it also enables us to do a lot of other things that help possibly improve the signal to noise ratio on a mailing list. Uh, I think we've all been on a mailing list, possibly Fedora Devel, where someone can't stop saying something stupid and they want to make sure that you heard them say something stupid 150 times a day. Uh, it stopped being productive after the first time they said it, but they won't stop saying it. But there's no good way short of actually writing a filter for your email client to make them stop appearing in your mailbox. So what we can do with a web form approach that we can't easily do with a mailing list is we can apply the concept of karma to a thread, to a user, and then you can say, well, that post was not insightful. I'm going to give it a thumbs down. That was really insightful. I'm going to give it a thumbs up. And then the score for the user, for the post, for the whole thread will be visible in the web forum interface. And we can export that through Mailman as an X header. So over time, that score is going to go up. That score is going to go down. And if somebody can't stop trolling, their score is going to go down pretty far. And you can very easily set a filter that says anybody's score who goes down into the toilet is not going to get read. And again, so that, that means that, that he's still trolling his heart out on the mailing list. You're just not seeing a thing he wrote. So I mean, we're stealing ideas uh, from, uh, from places like Reddit, from places like Slashdot, from places like LWN, from places like all these web forums that have already figured out that, that trolls, telling them to stop is not going to work. You just need to figure out how to make it so that the average user never sees them. So HyperKitty is something that is a work in progress. We have full read functionality working like the mock-up shows today. And uh, we have the beginnings of write functionality uh, coming soon. All right, there's, there's hands going up in the back. Can we maybe take questions at the end? All right. Next problem. The GUI install update sucks. No, I'm not talking about YUM or RPM. So anyone in that team here, you're off the hook. I'm not referring to that specifically. What users do not like. They do not like seeing there are 374 updates to install every day. <laughs> they also do not like cryptic dialogues. They do not understand why Zulrunner, LibSexy, NSS, or LibGUDev1 needs to be updated. They don't know what any of these things do. Users do not like seeing a useless alphabetized list of results when they search for an application. You should try it sometime. Search for, oh, search for Office. I believe that the last time I looked through, there were still Perl hits that were coming in on that search result. And that's arguably not what any user is trying to achieve when they're searching for Office. Users do not care how something is packaged at all. It breaks my heart to say this, because anyone who knows me knows how much time and effort I have put into packaging things. But they don't care. They really don't. What users want is easy to find software in development environments. They want easy to install software. They want simple, predictable, reliable updates. Now everyone in the room is like, yeah, that sounds really smart. How are you going to pull that off? But here's an idea we have. Let's take package kit's front end and bury it in the backyard and forget it ever existed. Because I don't think we've met anyone that really thought that was a good end solution. There's a lot of good code in package kit, but the user experience is terrible. So let's, I'm going to say a dirty word here, let's make an app store. Not like an app store where we sell things, because I have no interest in selling anything. What I do want is I want to have the same experience for the user that they get from an app store, where we group things by sensible categories, we have an intelligent search, that lets people find the thing they're actually looking for. And then we make it really nice and simple for them to install it. And this starts with the stuff that we have packaged in the Fedora universe and goes a step beyond that. Uh, there's a concept called Fedora formulas that some of you might have heard about that we're knocking around as an idea. And the basic idea is that we use something like Ansible playbooks to manage the way that we deploy software on systems. So it could be an RPM. It could be a software collection. It could be a giant bag of bits. It could be 
uh, calls into PyPy, it could be gem install, it could be a cartridge, anything that we can put in a playbook for Ansible, we can add as an entry to this app store. The user doesn't care how we do it. The user doesn't care if hundreds of tiny ferrets bring this software in and put it on your computer. As long as it's there and it works and they know how to use it and it's not hard for them to use, they're gonna have a good experience with this. So that's the model that I'd really like to see us move towards for installing software. Now, updating software, there's no good reason why we shouldn't be batching our software up in a monthly update. There isn't. And it allows us to be able to take that update and test it as a set of packages before we push it out to the user and say, every month the user's gonna get a monthly update. Now that doesn't mean that security updates don't need to go out asynchronously, I mean, that's still gonna have to happen. Uh, but the general idea here is that the user should never see 374 updates are pending. They should see that once a month, a tested bundle of updates for stuff in their critical path is ready for them. And they're sure, there's gonna be lots of other packages that we don't consider critical path that are gonna have updates during that window, but we should consider those optional. Because if they weren't optional, they would have been in the critical path. So, <laughs> I mean, now let's talk about bug filing. Now, uh, I'm not calling out ABRT, well, okay, maybe, maybe I'm just a little bit, but. Um, we want users to report bugs. Right now, that involves them having to create a separate Bugzilla account, find the right website, ignore most of the choices they're presented with, guess the right package name, and send us a text-only description of the bug. How many people, as developers or contributors in Fedora, have a good experience with users filing bugs in Fedora? Yeah, there's nobody's hands up, all right. So the result is that most users either file terrible bugs against the wrong op product that we don't find until three releases afterwards when we're end of lifing it, or uh, they're just too intimidated to file bugs. Now what users really want is a simple way, usually by an integrated client, uh, to file a bug, one screen. Using something they already have set up, hopefully a Fedora account, and something that allows them to really be able to show us, not just tell us, what the bug is. And then let's start leveraging some of the fancy new toys we get from Systemd. Let's get a list of the last 10 applications that were open, that aren't open anymore, and let's present those to the user and say, hey, is your bug in one of those? Because if it crashed, it probably was. So here's a mock-up for something that we, we uh, drew together to uh, come up with what a bug reporter might look like. Now, this is one screen. It shows you the last several applications. It allows you to type in search. It's very application focused, not package focused. Because again, the user has no idea what libsexy is supposed to be doing on their system, but they do have a very good idea that Firefox isn't working right. Describing the issue, and then having the ability to attach a file, take a screenshot, or make a screencast. Show me the thing crashing. Here's another problem. Users don't engage. Nothing in the operating system today tells the user about the universe of Fedora. At best, it tells them about the universe of the window manager they're using. But we don't show them where they can participate. We don't help them feel like they're at all part of a community. We don't encourage them to try anything. So here's what we want to do. We want users to have and use a single Fedora account identity. Right now, the only people that are using Fedora accounts are contributors or participants at the high end. Uh, we want to use that account identity across all the Fedora web applications, including HyperKitty. And we want to make a fun way to invite users to participate in Fedora. At the operating system level, at the participant level, at Fedora-related events like this, at the contributor level, and we want to be able to encourage users to help us with specific tasks. Because there's lots of work to be done and lots of work that users can help us do, but the users don't know what they need to be doing. So we can sort of steer them in a direction, then they start to become participants. So this is the idea behind a concept called Fedora badges. And since I have not a whole lot of time left, I can't go too deep into this, but there's two core ideas behind badges. One is that it helps the user feel like they're participating in a larger community because they're earning badges for doing things locally, participating in a broader sense, going to an event, uh, making a contribution, and it also helps us gather statistics about what users do. 
not what they install, but what they use. So if we have a badge, for example, that says, you opened Firefox 314 times. We call it the Firefox Pi badge. And when they earn that locally, we have a rules engine that's listening to systemd to help us track these sorts of things. And when they meet the criteria that's set in the local rules engine, it emits a notification to be sent across a message bus that exists today into our infrastructure to say that Fedora account user Spot has earned this badge. And then we can go back and run a report and say that 75% of the Fedora users who participated in badges have earned the I opened Firefox 314 times. So that gives us the answer to the question that we have wanted to be able to answer for a long time, which is how often is my package used? How often is my software actually used? And sure, there's going to be people that use and don't opt into this model. And there's you know, going to be people that uh, slip through the cracks on this. But it will give us better statistical data than we've ever had before. Now, I think it's time to remember that we should always be innovating. We know these problems exist today. We know there are more that I haven't even talked about. We know they're hard but we know they can be solved. We also know that if we do it right, users will love these solutions. We have built things that users loved before. We will build them again. It may not happen at first, but if we iterate through design and UX testing, it will happen. If you are targeting a goal of building solutions that users love, and you can repeatedly iterate through this process, it does work. And solving them makes Fedora more fun to use. And more fun is more users, more users is a bigger pool for participants, and more participants is a bigger pool for contributors. I could put that Lion King picture back up if we need to. But the way that we make these solutions a reality is that we all have to work together to make this happen. We can't just say, well, Red Hat's going to do that. We can't just say, well, the Fedora community is going to do that. We can't just say someone at Upstream is going to solve these problems for us. Uh, and we need to think about long-term planning because these solutions don't happen in a six-month cycle. Uh, we have to be looking beyond any single Fedora or RHEL release and saying, how do we solve these hard problems? And uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I will uh, take questions at this point. OK, we're in the back. So the question was is if we were planning on any improvements to the Fedora hosted experience because that experience is pretty terrible for those users. And we would love to do that, but it's when everything else is so on fire, that fire is a little less urgent. So uh, I think that we certainly are open to uh, suggestions and people who have uh, a desire to help us improve in that space, but uh, it's not something that's immediately on our roadmap. Yes? Mm -hmm. No one. We have a mock-up. That's all we have. <laughs> uh, Mo Duffy did that mock-up for us. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. 
so repeating the question, the, the question there was, is why don't I talk about the participant experience and how that's different from the user experience? So there's a couple quick points. I think that all participants are still users. And so when I talked about users, I wasn't excluding participants in that. I was talking about the common ground that they all share as a first step. Certainly, we want to ensure that participants have a positive experience. Uh, for example, with the software installation mechanism, I could probably have given a equally long talk about just that idea. But the thought is that YUM is still available for those users who want to install on a per package basis. The tool should be allowed to be customized so that if you want to have visibility in what's actually happening, you can be exposed to the playbooks. You can open those up directly and see what they do or get detailed information about what's going to happen before it happens. Because in a universe where we're not bound by simply packaging, it's not enough to say this package is getting installed. We need to be able to tell the user, this is the process that we're going to do. These are the commands that are going to be run. These are the files that are going to be changed on your system. Go ahead. We're probably going to do both, honestly. Uh, we're definitely going to do the, uh, the raw filtering, but we are already talking about the idea of what's known as a hell ban, which is where you basically, as the moderator of the list, you uh, make it so that you ban a user so that he still sees himself posting and receives all his own emails, but no one else actually does. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't realize he's been banned until no one replies to him for a really long time. Uh, but I think both of those approaches are be what we would go forward with. We probably would not uh, make it so that mailman auto filters by default on that. I'm not sure I understand your question there. Can you rephrase it for me? I don't, I'm not sure I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that I, I'm not the one that's qualified to answer that question. I mean, I certainly would very much like to see GNOME continue to be design-driven. I think they are. I think it's not always as clear as I would like, but I think that they certainly feel the same way about user experience. I think that we could do more in partnership with GNOME to be doing constructive UX testing and trying to come up with common problems that we both share because we are very much in the same boat and working together as a team to try to solve those problems. And I've been informed I'm out of time, so if anybody has questions afterwards, uh, come find me. I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you.